Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, it's another Jay Toll and Response video, uh, and it seems he hasn't taken any of my advice on board, uh, and he's chosen to double down or maybe even triple down. Now, there are four claims that he makes in this video that I want to address. Uh, the first one is that he can see Baja in Mexico at something like 200 miles away. All right, so let's hear it from the horse's mouth. But if that wasn't enough, while processing my footage, I found out that I could be seeing even farther away. While analyzing footage between um, Point Loma and the Coronado Islands, uh, I spotted land and that has to be way down in Baja, California. Unbelievable. Have a look at this, folks. Okay, so he doesn't give a specific observer location in the video, but he does show himself pulling over by the side of the road near Mount Wilson Observatory uh, and sets up his telescope there. So here's a still from the video. And this was pretty easy to find on Google Earth. Uh, coordinates are at the top left, and according to Google Earth, elevation is 56, 57 feet. Uh, and I'll add five feet for his tripod. So all I've done here is draw a line of sight from his location at Mount Wilson uh, and found the land that Jay Tolan is referring to. So this point here happens to be 200 miles away and uh, it's the westernmost land in his line of sight. So I'm pretty certain that this is what he thinks he's seeing. But what I want you to take note of here is the heading to that edge, uh, 156.24 degrees. Uh, and then I've gone and lined up Jay Tolan's panorama in Google Earth uh, so that the hill in the photo on the left uh, matches up as well as that tuft of trees on the right hand side. Uh, and the terrain in the foreground matches up pretty well as well. Uh, so who can see the problem? Well done! Uh, that yellow line is the line we just drew in Google Earth and that's as far as the land extends. There is no land to the right of that line. The blue line is where Jay Tolan thinks he's identified something, uh, but what can I tell you, dude? There's nothing but ocean out there. So I think the moral to the story is stop pointing at any old fucking blur on the horizon. All right, so that's claim number one dismissed. All right, claim number two is that we can see further with infrared because it refracts less. But the second benefit is more important. Infrared is less affected by refraction, this upward refraction that limits our uh, visibility on the flat Earth. And uh, that's why we can see that much farther in infrared, you know. If you look at the photo with the prism, um, the longer wavelengths uh, bend less. Okay, so he's technically correct. It does refract less. Uh, but the amount is so incredibly small that it really makes no difference to any photo analysis. So I spent a bit of time today trying to figure out how best to explain this. And the best way, I think, uh, is to show how much difference there is in the hidden height if you use infrared instead of something in the middle of the spectrum like green. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated process, uh, so please bear with me for a minute or two. So first up, I'll be using the equations for the refractive index of air from this paper by Philip Sidor in 1996. Uh, the paper's been cited well over a thousand times, and just to put all the, the flurf minds at ease, uh, no, this paper isn't circular reasoning or being the question of a radius. Uh, these equations are derived entirely from experiments in a lab, so nothing to do with the shape of the Earth whatsoever. Uh, where the shape of the Earth does come into it is when we apply refraction to a curve calculator. And when we're using a curve calculator, all we're doing is asking it, if the Earth is a sphere, then what would we expect to see in reality? If our prediction matches reality, that's great. Uh, that's good evidence for the globe. If our prediction is completely wrong, then either the Earth isn't a globe, or maybe some other assumption is wrong. And what you'll see most flurfs do is use an image like the black swan to claim that they've debunked the globe, when really all they've done is shown that we can't apply standard refraction to every observation, particularly when those observations are performed very close to the surface. So I've been saying it for years now, get well above the surface where the conditions are much more stable and refraction is therefore predictable. Uh, I'll have a video coming out in a little while that brings all the data to the table to show this, uh, so keep an eye out for that. 
And if you've been in this debate for any length of time, uh, you'll know the curve calculators incorporate refraction by using a larger radius than the actual radius of the Earth. And in the Metabunk calculator, that larger radius is one-sixth bigger, uh, or 7 over 6R as we call it. Uh, but why do we use a larger radius? Uh, it's really just to simplify the geometry. So in reality, which is complicated, uh, we have curving Earth and a curving light ray. Uh, but doing geometry with two curves is really, really painful. Uh, so it'd be a whole lot easier if the geometry was just one curve and one straight line. So what we do uh, is flatten out the light ray until it's completely straight but making sure that we maintain the relative curvature between the Earth and the light ray. Uh, so I'm going to start moving that slider up in the top left in a sec. And what I want you to notice is that as the light ray flattens out, uh, we need to increase the radius of the Earth proportionally so that we maintain the relative curvature. So if you watch the, the Earth radius on the x-axis, uh, you'll see it go from 6371 up to about 7500. Uh, when the light ray becomes a straight line. So there you go. That's why 7 over 6R exists, and that's why we can treat the light ray as a straight line and do things like draw tangents to the circle. So now we've got to figure out how much the light is actually curving in the atmosphere, uh, and what we're going to do here is apply the formula from the Sidor paper to two different wavelengths. Uh, on the left we've got green, which is roughly in the middle of the visible spectrum, and on the right we've got infrared. Uh, now I can't remember exactly what wavelength uh, J. Tolan's filter is, but we'll go with 950 nanometers. And as you hopefully already know, uh, the amount that the light bends is proportional to the refractive gradient. So we're going to work out the refractive index at the surface, and I've chosen 20 degrees and 50% humidity. Uh, and then see what the refractive index is at one kilometer above the surface. And as we know, the temperature decreases as you gain altitude, so I've reduced it to 10 degrees, uh, and the pressure is 90,000 pascals. Right, so let's do the green side. Uh, if we plug those values into the formula with a wavelength of 532 nanometers, these are the two refractive indices we get. And if we express that as a gradient, which is just a change in n per kilometer, then we get this, uh, 0.0000-2178. Okay, over to the infrared side, uh, plugging in 950 nanometers uh, for conditions at the surface and at one kilometer up, we get these refractive indices. And again, let's express that as a gradient, uh, we get 0.00002147. So we'll make use of those gradient figures in a minute, but what I want you to appreciate here is that if you compare, say, the refractive index of green light at the surface, so 1.000273, to infrared light at the surface, 1.000269, it's different by about four parts per million. But if you compare the gradients, they differ by about three parts in 10 million. So yes, if infrared light is traveling through a vacuum with a refractive index of precisely one uh, and suddenly hits some sea level air, then it will bend less than the green light. And this is basically what the prism analogy is showing. Uh, but the analogy is misguided because we're not coming from a vacuum here. We're already in the medium and that medium has a continuous gradient. So anyway, now we're going to take those gradients that we just calculated uh, and convert them into radius multipliers that we can then use in the curve calculator. Uh, and the formula for doing that is at the top. So for green, we get a radius multiplier of 1.161117. And for infrared, we get a multiplier of 1.158460. All right, and now we need to apply it to an observation. And I was thinking we apply it to this plateau in J. Tolan's footage, uh, which is almost 150 miles away. And I've got the elevation and distances in metric on screen for everyone that's not stuck in the 19th century. So after plugging that into a curve calculator, here's the final result. Uh, if you compare the green light, which is on the left, to the infrared light on the right, you get a difference of three whole meters in hidden height. Uh, now, I probably don't have to tell you that over a distance of 238 kilometers, three meters means absolutely fuck all. 
All right, so that's claim number two dispensed with. Uh, we don't see further with infrared because it refracts less. We actually see further with infrared because the shorter wavelengths are much more likely to be scattered away by the atmosphere. All right, now claim number three is a bit of a quickie, so have a listen. In the third inset down below, I showed the ideal gas line rearranging we get a ratio of P over T equal to something that is proportional to the index of refraction. Or is it? No, it's not. Um, now this is one of those times where I had to pause and ask myself, did he really fuck this up so badly? Or like, am I the one having a, a psychotic episode? Uh, so just for everyone playing along at home, the N in the ideal gas law, which is pressure times volume is equal to N times the ideal gas constant times temperature. N is not the refractive index. N is the number of moles of the gas. Okay, fourth and final claim, uh, J. Tolan doubling down big time on upwards refraction. You see my friends, the atmosphere is a lot more complicated than this ideal gas law. There is water vapor and the temperature changes, um, creates condensates. Um, and so those have higher index of refraction. And so the atmosphere uh, actually bends light upwards, indicating that the index of refraction increases. It does not decrease with altitude. Okay, it increases. Ah, oh, dude, I really don't know what to say at this point. You've dug yourself so deep into this upward refraction thing. And I think it's because you know that if you're wrong about it and light typically bends downwards, it means that all of your previous analyses with your theodolite become excellent globe proofs. So upwards refraction is the hill you chose to die on. No, that's, that's fine with me. Anyway, in this little clip, you do mention temperature and humidity. And yes, they do affect the refractive index. But you know what has an enormous impact? Air pressure. And that kind of surprises me for a guy that flies around the country a lot on pressurized aircraft. So remind me again why they're pressurized? Oh, that's right, because there's not enough fucking air outside. In fact, it's almost like the higher you go up, the less air there is. And the less air there is, the closer it is to a vacuum. And the closer it is to a vacuum, the closer the refractive index gets to one, right? Isn't that the definition of refractive index? Or is there some kind of homeopathic refraction where the less air there is, the stronger the refraction? Anyway, that's enough for this video. Uh, feel free to go over to his channel and point out where he went wrong. Uh, he'll probably block you, uh, which is no doubt safer for his mental health uh, than having his whole house of cards fall down. Later.